I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes this evening. My name is Tim. I'm sort of the unofficial videographer of the group. I'd like to welcome all of you. And the college consists of three parts. First is a brief announcement period. Second is our presentation. Third is our questions and answers. And fourth, we then have our infamous free-for-all, which is uh, where you can say anything about the speech or against the speech, but it is. Let's uh, have our rules. Our first uh, rule is one rule at a time. The rest of us uh, should be quiet and listen so that uh, we know what's going on. All right. And the second rule is that we do not insult anybody here personally. Their ideas are fair game, but uh, we don't call them nuts or uh, a liar or uh, we generally try to be nice to them, but uh, you know, within some sort of civil bounds, uh, you know, we, the management doesn't like blood on the floor. Right? Okay. okay, so beyond that, uh, we also have a program. We already went so through it, Brown. Is that we will hear from our speakers. Uh, the second is that uh, they will be exposed to your questions. And the third uh, is that, uh, that you get to rebut them. And they get to rebut us. So, all right. Without any further ado, then, uh, by the way, have you chosen your order of presentation? All right. All right. Uh, Gene Walker, Carla Chu, and Alan Lindrum. Yay! These are Unitarians, Unitarian Universalists. I think universalist means that nobody goes to hell. Yeah, <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, well, that's what we all want, but uh, it's not exactly uh, what everybody concludes is. Guy uh, Elpiravitz, I thought was a great speaker, and you had him here. So now you've got me who <laughs> is just so-so. And I'm talking about corporate personhood. Doesn't make sense, but it has a big impact on us. According to Politico, the Koch brothers and their friends intend to spend $889 million in the run-up to the 2016 election. It's a historic sum that would mark them as more powerful than the Republican Party. So we need to know how we got to this point and how we can get out of it. First talking about the Constitution written by 55 gentlemen who were well-bred, well-read, well-fed, and well-wed. <laughs> the strength of the Federalists resulted in a Constitution designed to protect private property. Fortunately, opposition by the Democrats meant that the states had to have a Bill of Rights if they were to pass it. The word, you know, the conservatives are always telling us things are constitutional or not constitutional. Well, corporation does not, the word doesn't appear in the Constitution. Yeah. At the time it was ratified, they didn't really like corporations very much. Remember the Boston Tea Party against the East India Company? We the people at that time meant adult male, white, with a certain amount of property. So under the new government, corporations were controlled by the states. Charters were specific about what they could do for how long, where, and when. Stockholders were liable, no longer the case. They lasted only five to ten years. They had a specific time. And in order to have a, a corporation, you had to represent a clear benefit to the public good. 
Almost none of those things are true anymore. If they were violate, they were their charters were frequently revoked. In their inception, they were accountable to the government and had responsibilities to the people. About a hundred years later, they began trying through the Supreme Court to obtain human rights. In 1868, the 14th Amendment was to help protect freed slaves and indentured servants. And about almost 20 years later, well, during those 20 years, corporations tried and tried and tried through the Supreme Court to get rights of humans. And in 1886, in a court case called Santa Clara County and the Southern Pacific Railroad, which found in favor of, the Supreme Court found in favor of the railroad. But it was just about the rights of the property beside the railroad, not a very significant case. They tried and failed to make the case that the 14th Amendment applied to corporations. <clears throat> the Justice, Sam Miller, chastised the corporations in the majority opinion. He wrote, one pervading purpose of the 14th Amendment was the freedom of the slaves and the protection of newly made freemen and citizens from the oppression of those who had formerly exercised unlimited domination. The body of the ruling contained nothing about personhood. In fact, the Chief Justice said they didn't, they didn't rule on that. No, no Nowhere in the ruling does it say anything about that. Excuse me. But there's a head note, which is written by the clerk. This clerk used to be president of a railroad. And he wrote in the head note that they had said that corporations <coughs> have rights. In 50 years of the of that ruling, half of 1% of the cases were about African American protection. That's half of 1%. 50% gave benefits to corporations. In 1893, the protection of due process, the right to refuse to speak if you're accused of a crime, was given to corporations. In 1906, the Fourth Amendment right to search and seizure was given to corporations. OSHA and EPA the corporations say that surprise inspections are violations of their right of privacy. However, they can, they can have surprise inspections on employees' bodily fluids, phone conversations, and keystrokes. We can't expect, inspect their voting machines that determine the fate of our democracy. In 1928, they got freedom of press and speech. The Chief Justice Rehnquist, who's not really liberal, said that they should, have, they should be restrained from political activity. In 1976, money equals speech. And this is what has really, I think, inequality from 1979 has risen like this, and I think money equals speech is what has done it, basically. Um, the rich people then had the ability to throw money into elections to elect people who would vote for their policies, which means lower taxes so you can't spend money on the poor, that's mainly at lower taxes. Um, 
And then in 2010, Citizens United struck down provisions of the McCain-Feingold Act that prohibit, prohibited corporations and unions from electioneering, which was defined as broadcast cable or satellite that mentioned a candidate within 60 days of a general election or 30 days of a primary. <coughs> Um, then there was another one that it, it cut down a 1990 decision that upheld the rights of corporate spending to support or oppose political candidates. Thinking back to that $889 million that the Koch brothers are planning to spend, um, it seems like they will have two million times as much political speech as anyone who could give $450, or they'll have 20 million times as many rights if you could only give $45. With legal personhood, they're like superhumans. All the advantages, none of the disadvantages. Infinite lifespans, they can continue to accumulate wealth and power forever, cut off an arm or a leg or a head, it can still continue to exist. And lawyers invoke personhood status at their convenience, only if it's good for them. They also maintain their rights, mineral rights, drilling rights, air pollution credits, and under NAFTA, rights to future profits. So we hope Resistance to corporate personhood is evolving as resistance to slavery are revolved, evolved. Roll it back, get involved. Join, move to amend. Seems like a good way to get started. There's an affiliate chapter in Chicago. I'm not sure exactly where. There's a state one. We have one in Oak Park. Well, it's in Oak Park, but it's West Suburban for the whole western suburbs. Give me a few minutes, David. Okay. You've already got a referendum in your town and your state. The state has voted that they're in favor of move to amends amendment, and so is Chicago Alderman. So we're on our way. However, I think it takes about 20 million people to get something like this passed, so we really need to spread the word. And the next will be Alan, who will talk about what it takes. Okay, my section is called Changing the Constitution and Equivalent Actions. It's the shortest of the three pieces, and I might call it uh, Civic Lesson Review and Reality Check. Now, we all know that the Constitution says certain things, but there's a lot of things that are vague in it. And we have a Supreme Court that interprets and reinterprets the Constitution. Obviously, the Citizens United decision was a case of Supreme Court interpretation. Probably the easiest way to get a revision in a Supreme Court decision is actually to have time pass, to have the makeup of the Supreme Court change, and for a new Supreme Court to revise a decision, do a reinterpretation. Probably the most famous example of this is the case of what was originally Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, which established uh, separate e but equal, and then its reversal in Brown, uh, Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. Now, as far as amending the Constitution, looking at it in, in a general sense, with the exception of unusual circumstances, an unusual circumstance would have been right after the Civil War, when there was a requirement that some of the southern states that had seceded had to pass the 13th and or 14th Amendment in order to get their voting rights back in Congress. 
with, ex with those exceptions, you generally have to have broad bipartisan consensus behind any idea that it's going to become a constitutional amendment. You have to have both, both a two-thirds vote in both houses of the U.S. Congress. And then normally, you're going to have to have passage by both houses of the state legislatures by three-fourths of the states. That's a big hurdle. You're generally going to have to have probably overwhelming support by maybe one political party and maybe 35 to 50 percent uh, support by another party at a minimum. If you don't have that kind of broad partisan support, it isn't going to fly. Uh, in many of our lifetimes, we remember the Equal Rights Amendment. It got through Congress, but there wasn't su sufficient bipartisan support in enough of the states to get it passed. Okay. Now, as far as amending the Constitution, the only way it's happened thus far is to have a situation where two-thirds both by both houses of the Congress have led to the change. Now, with one exception, you've had to have three-fourths of the states <coughs> pass the uh, amendment. And by when I say pass, it means that both houses of the legislature, of course, in Nebraska, you just have one house, so it's just that one house that has to pass it. You only have to have a simple majority in each of these houses, but you have to have both houses and three-fourths of the states, which is now 38 states out of 50. The one exception was when they were revising or amending the amendments, or removing the amendment regarding prohibition. At that time, the amendment that came, was passed in Congress said it will be, it called upon the states to have state conventions to consider the amendment and to vote on whether to pass that new amendment eliminating prohibition. And that is how that amendment to the Constitution passed. But to, for that course to, to go forward, the amendment passed by Congress has to spell out that it's to be considered by state conventions. Otherwise, the normal course is it for it to go before state legislatures. <coughs> now, the Constitution does provide for another way of amending the Constitution. It allows for uh, two-thirds of the states to pass in both of their houses of, uh, their, general, of their legislatures a call for a constitutional convention. And we have a couple times, and probably in my lifetime, or certainly within the last 75 years or so, I'm 65, but um, we've had a situation where we almost had a constitutional convention. One was after the Supreme Court's decision that called for one man, one vote. A lot of the legislators didn't want to go that route. And they became one or two states short of calling for a constitutional convention. And in the 1980s, there was a movement to have a constitutional convention to uh, require a balanced budget amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And that fell just one or two states short of calling for a constitutional convention. Now, if this route were to be followed, the constitutional convention would have to consider the constitutional proposed constitutional amendment constitutional amendment that was the basis for calling the Constitutional Convention. But that such a convention would not be limited to that amendment. It could also come up with and consider other constitutional amendments. But of course, whatever such a constitutional convention would come up with still would have to go through the big hurdle of getting three-fourths of the states, you know, both houses, to pass any of those proposed constitutional amendments. So just because some, quote, crazy idea comes out of a convention doesn't mean it's going to become necessarily a, a constitutional amendment. Also, the Constitution does not spell out how the delegates to such a convention would be uh, selected, how many, uh, how they would vote. So we don't know, you know, if they'd be democratically, democratically selected by voters, just be selected by uh, various legislators appointed in a sense. Um, we don't know how many. You know, it could be one per con uh, congressional district, but who knows? You know, you could just have five, even though you have 40 congressional districts, like in California or something. There's, there's no guidelines. It could very well be they could be selected based on whoever is the largest political donors to the majority party that state. Those are the people who will go to the convention. 
Nothing says that that's not the case. So, you know, there's a lot of issues as to whether a constitutional convention would be in any way reflective of the actual population of the United States and, and the general views of the public. So, anyway, we would have to deal with that if we got to that point. So, anyway, that is your evening's reminder as to how we amend the Constitution and the, the significant challenges that uh, confront us with any of these routes. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gene. I just want to let you know I do have at least 25 copies of basically what I've covered. So if any of you would like a printed copy for your reminders of this, you can raise your hand or come up. Yeah, brother, come on. Okay. So, but if you, you, know, if you don't want it, you don't have to have it. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks to uh, both of you, uh, to Carla and Alan. Uh, I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, two things are what efforts have been made to approve a uh, move to amend. And the second thing is what can you do if you wish to uh, help in getting this amendment passed? So, uh, efforts uh, start out with efforts to uh, overturn or uh, or overturn or alter Citizens United. Citizens United uh, versus uh, uh, Federal Elections Commission was passed by the Supreme Court January 21st, 2010. Uh, it says that uh, allows that unlimited spending by corporations and unions to uh, influence <coughs> elections. The response to Citizens Amend uh, was the formation of the Move to Amend Coalition. That was formed September 23rd of 2010, calling for a constitutional amendment that would have two parts. Uh, it would say money is not a form of free speech, and rights belong to humans only, not corporations. Uh, since that formation, uh, a bunch of things have happened. Uh, uh, start up with that uh, groups have formed in th at least 33 states. There are at least 13 groups in, in Illinois that are working on move to amend. Uh, a guy named David Cobb, uh, a few of you probably saw him speak. He has gone across the country speaking on Move to Amend, uh, talking about creating democracy and challenging corporate rule. There's also been a allied uh, uh, act that has been suggested. It's called the Disclose Act, and this pretty much uh, involves making the contributions to uh, to candidates public. So it's it's called that the Disclose Act is uh, the subtitle is Democracy is Strengthened by Casting by Casting Light on Spending in Elections. But that is uh, not actually the move to amend amendment. It's just a uh, act that has been suggested. The best of my knowledge it hasn't passed. Uh, there have been petitions, and uh, I will tell you a little bit later that uh, those are on move to amend. Uh, Carla Chu just told me I had the number 370,000 that had signed this petition online. Again, you would go to movetoamend.org and you could sign this petition. Uh, Carla says over 500,000 people have uh, signed this petition now. Uh, there have been referenda and resolutions. These are in local areas, and uh, for instance, as far as I know, every time they have put this on the ballot, it has passed. But it passes by a different <laughs> amounts in different areas. Oak Park, Illinois, has the highest, uh, I heard of, 85% of the people that voted on that. Uh, issue uh, uh, voted for it. The lowest is 52% that I heard of anyway. 
Mm -hmm. And that was in a conservative town in, uh, in Ohio. Uh, so, there, uh, now there are other things that have happened. One is in Illinois, uh, Carla mentioned that, uh, moved to amend, went to the, our legislature, and uh, the Unitarian Universalists for Social Justice put out what we call an action alert. It's a letter uh, that we sent to our legislators, from, uh, goes to about 130 people who uh, send out letters to our legislators saying we're in favor of this move to amend resolution. And uh, that actually passed in uh, May of 2000 and uh, May in, uh, in 2013. So that did pass the Illinois legislature. That is not a move to amend amendment. It's just saying they're in favor of the move to amend amendment. Uh, there are other things. Uh, uh, closer to home and, and closer to me personally that have happened that I'm aware of. One is we had an inequality conference uh, in, in February where a uh, move to amend literature and a workshop on move to amend were part of the talking about the inequality in the United States. So I got a lot of information there. The other kind of surprising one uh, I got a kick out of this. I was on vacation in Sarasota, Florida, of all places. Sarasota, Florida is kind of an upper middle class uh, place. Be you know, beautiful, the weather was great and all that. I'm on vacation. I just want to look at palm trees and take it easy. Uh, they had a move to amend demonstration. I was kind of surprised. So I went to this demonstration and in this upper middle class uh, luxury community, you might say. There were about 15 people uh, who had a demonstration for two hours at a big uh, big intersection in Sarasota, Florida. So these are the kinds of things that are happening. Now, the, the, having uh, here, having been a regular here at the College of Complex, I know I've heard all kinds of stuff that people want to do. I've sat through, what, 20 or 30 of these where we have some issue that comes up. Oh, what a great issue, and that's the last you hear of it. So I think it's incumbent upon me as a regular here to say what I think personally. That doesn't mean Carla and Alan agree with this at all. But what do I think? the chances of this ever getting through. Here's my statement. Again, I may be way off, who knows. I am an optimist, so I think there's a 50-50 chance of move to amend, being uh, amending our Constitution within the next 20 years. Now, will this happen? Well, I'll tell you what. It isn't going to happen if people don't get behind it. Right. So if you feel this is important, if you are concerned about corporations, if you are concerned about too much power getting into the hands of too few people, then you might want to work on move to a map. And this goes to my second part. Everybody here, uh, let me say, is there anybody here from uh, Indiana? I don't see any hands. Of course, I can't see. But I don't see any hands. Uh, okay, but... Uh, There's ten of them. No. Okay, ten of them, okay. Well, uh, we have uh, some information from, from Indiana. But in the rest of you all, should all have this. And it's like Perigo uh, uh, spaghetti sauce. Everything's in here. It's in here. Okay, uh, uh, here on the first page it talks about what you can do. And uh, it's a little bit repetitive. The first four really tell the story. You can sign a petition online. Uh, you can join uh, a group. 
uh, you can, uh, now i got to look, uh, you can uh, read more about uh, Move to Amend, uh, and you, uh, and you can uh, write to your legislator. If, uh, so if you write to your legislator, the question is, who is your legislator? Well, probably nine out of ten people in this room know who their legislator is. But some of you don't. If you don't, how do you find out? Well, like I said, it's in there, except for your voter card. I think this is my voter card. On your voter card, if you don't know your legislator, you look on the top of the card, and you see a couple numbers, ward, uh, precinct, and yes, see con, C-O-N-G. That, uh, that number tells you who your congressperson is. Uh, mine is, uh, I'm in con 9. If you look at the last page, you'll see that my uh, representative is Representative Jan Schakowsky. So you can find your legislator on here. Again, if you were from Indiana, I got some uh, information on uh, those uh, people in Indiana. But So the first page tells you the things that you can do. The last two, I guess, you could join our group, for instance, uh, and you could read in general. But actually, all you got to do is read this, because everything is in here. So again, the second page is the letter that I wrote. Hey, you can write a better letter. Don't, uh, don't let me stop you from writing something better. The third page tells about a summary of the arguments for the uh, move to amend. The next page, and this is something I have to confess I didn't do, but you can get a DVD on Move to Amend. On the fourth page, it tells the two latest uh, semi-Move to Amend uh, things. The first one is by uh, Senator Sanders, if you know Senator Sanders from uh, Vermont. Uh, we don't feel this is the best one because it only works on uh, Citizens United. It doesn't work on a corporate person, but the next one is by Representative Nolan, and uh, it is pretty much the move to amend amendment. I did call uh, Representative Nolan's office yesterday, uh, and they, this tells me something. Say so that, hey, what are the chances of this happening? I call his office yesterday, and I said, hey, you know, this is a new Congress. Even I'm smart enough to figure out you got to put a new. Uh, resolution. Did you guys put in a new resolution yet? The guy said, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, I just wonder how serious uh, they are there. But anyway, I think it will be eventually put in. Uh, you don't need that, incidentally, to write the letter. You can simply write the letter and say, I'm in favor of move to amend, and here's what it means to me, and here's why I think it it should pass. The next page is the move to amend amendment. Tells you that. The next two pages are talking points so that if you've got some, you want to know a little bit more about move to amend, you can look at that. And then the final, final two pages are your uh, uh, U.S. Senators, how to get those, and your uh, U.S. Reps. Uh, I thank uh, Reverend Jean Darling, who's uh, also a member of our group, uh, for giving me some of this information. And um, Mike Brennan, I think some of you know Mike Brennan. He's been a speaker here. So he has also given me this, uh, some of this information. So that's, so, uh, that's it. If, you, if we want this done, we have to do it. The rich are not going to help us. The corporations are not going to help us. The pretty people are not going to help us. This is for we the people. Thank you.
guys have questions? Of course we can. We know that. Right back. For our speakers. Oh, he lost. Yeah. First lucky question. David? Yes, with all due respect, the list on the back needs to be updated. Uh, Brad Schneider is not a congressman anymore. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You're absolutely right. Al and Lindra still just told me that, so um, I can't. I stand corrected. Thank you. You know, what? Who is it? I don't have to stand. Congressman from that district, Dole. the infamous Bruce Dole. No, Robert Dole. Robert Dole or Robert Dole? Yes, Mike. You, you guys sound pretty familiar with the Supreme Court's decision on uh, Citizens United. So the. Who's the Chief Justice Roberts? Mm, yeah. He was kind of the spearheader of this, right? Yeah. He supported, he supported the majority. Yeah. So what was his, what did he envision, what was his grand vision to, to have more money in the election process? Did he think it was good for the economy or good for the business? Or did he have any, anything in his pea brain to <laughs> think about anything? <laughs> Did, or did he like think that, well, this is great that all these big, wealthy, whatever's, unions, corporations, people, coke, this industries, what was he thinking? <laughs> that, that their interpretation in, in a broad sense oh, sure. is that uh, any legislation uh, that restricted giving was a restriction on free speech, and that was conflict with the First Amendment. It was free speech. That. Basically, that's in a nutshell. Uh, you know, he had no that's other the main thrust of their decision. But I think we probably like the idea that they have a lot more free speech than the rest of us. He liked the idea of what that he did. That all those rich guys have a lot more free speech than the rest of us. Did he leave any information on the table at all on why he had to know that this would be a problem? Huge problem. He didn't have to. It's all in mind, Carl. All right, Charles. Yeah, I'm working to have the government regulate the railroads. Are you saying the railroads would have no input in this process, or would be precluded from participating? I don't think that's the fact. I think the idea is that they couldn't they couldn't spend fifty million in order to elect all the people that they wanted to vote their way. I mean it's mainly money and power. And they just have more power than the rest of us. And these wouldn't go away at once. I think they would have everything would have to be voted on again even if we did get this amendment. I have Koch Brother products that, I mean, some of you may want to just buy Koch Brothers, but I'd rather you just not buy Koch Brothers. So I have a list of Koch Brother products here. Or many lists. Next. All right. Uh, Rita? I'm trying to remember what you said, Carl, about um, they're competing on the same level or something like that. And I, would you expand on that? Because I, I they're, don't they're giving the Koch brothers and maybe yeah. 20 or 30 other yeah, other rich people are expecting Not at a way in a camera. $889 million into the 2016 election and I think there used to be something like four hundred and sixty five dollars that somebody could even companies could give per candidate. Well that means if if I could give if I could give four hundred and sixty five they only have twenty million more power or more free speech than I do. But if I could only uh, two million more. If I could give only forty five then they have 20 million more free speech power than I do. So I just, 
out of line, it seems to me. Um, could you speak on two things? Does this include foreign corporations in the first place? And also, well, oh. I'm not Go sure ahead. about foreign corporations, but it does include the Chamber of Commerce, which gets its money from foreign corporations. So basically, foreign co corporations can have an effect. Um, and also, I wanted to ask about um, uh, what has been said before that, that a corporation is a collection of people, and so um, why can't a collection of people be considered a person rather than... Well, those people already are considered people, persons. That if they're considered a person in the corporation, they're considered as two persons, one person for themselves and another person for their activity in the corporation. Oh, uh, I got a question. You mentioned the magic word foreign corporation. Would you like to define that? Since you're incorporated in Illinois and you go to Indiana, you're a foreign corporation. Uh -oh. What do you mean by it? Well, I meant out of this USA, outside the USA. Yeah. So James gets. <laughs> yes, I thought we wanted our money back. I don't know how to figure out. You know, obviously, there's a lot of benefits to the structure and financial implications of the modern corporation. I myself could go right now to the website of the state of Illinois and incorporate myself and have a company, and at the same time, then shield my personal assets from the company, which would be very powerful in a lawsuit should something happen. Um, can I get your stance on that? And that does imply some kind of personhood in a legal sense. Because from what my understanding of the corporation is, it's changed radically since the days of the King of England where the state had a charter. All you got to do now is get a group of people or an individual together and they use it to structure things like issuing stock, like you know getting a board of directors in, even your own... Uh, move to amend people or LLCs or something along this line that uses the legal structure of the modern corporation and a company to incorporate. Can you comment, please? Well, should they have the right to destroy things and not have to testify and not be blamed, such as Enron, which got a lot of people's money just down the drain, but the people in Enron couldn't be sued and didn't have to testify because they're a corporation. Could I add to that? Uh, you know, this to me means that corporations are subordinate to the people. Corporations are subordinate to the people. They have to be controlled. They're normally controlled by the government. Someday, maybe we will control the government, and then the corporations will do what they're supposed to do, and not beyond that. Define what you mean by corporation exactly. Corporation is a corporation. You just said it. Yeah. You can form a corporation in any, almost any state. But in the past, way in the past, those corporations were controlled and limited and uh, watched and supervised through the government, not them supervising the government and supervising us. But at the same time, you have the benefits of the modern corporations by being able to incorporate a vast pool of capital together so that something can get done. For example, Charlie's, Charlie with the railroads, they never would have been able to construct it with, without the structure of the modern corporation. Yeah. You couldn't construct... Okay. Yeah, the argument is not that there shouldn't be corporations, but there, that there should be some limitations and that certain uh, rights that corporations have claimed as individuals should not be there. That does not mean that there shouldn't be corporations, that there should not be some protection for investors and so forth. If they're putting money into a certain venture, that they may protect their individual funds from the business venture. There are certain things that are appropriate for a corporation and for states to say, we give you these rights. But the argument here is that 
uh, corporations have taken this too far and that the courts have allowed them to go, take it too far in getting all kind of rights that individuals have which are really not essential to for their function as corporations and that with proper oversight their, their rights should be more limited than they currently have uh, with personhood. Yes, uh, Charles Pennock. Yeah, uh, I watch a lot of Congress and the Republican Party seem to think the corporations are very beneficial to the United States. And a lot of voters seem to think that way too. And they're job creators, they keep saying. And they <laughs> help takers. the middle and lower classes get ahead. And they talk about the dream. And so far, I was listening today. And you guys are all just the opposite. Yeah, obviously, we have Are they going to cause unemployment? Uh, obviously, through time, there are waves of what issues are most important to the majority of the population in this country. The most important elections are those that happen in the years that end in zero. 2000, 2010, 2020, 2030, and so forth. So those years are the years in which state legislatures and governors are elected that oversee the new remapping of Congress. That has a large impact on the shape of Congress for the following 10 years. We know in 2010 it was a very Republican year. Not only elected a lot more Republican legislatures that had converted to a much more gerrymandered districts that favored Republicans for this decade. That might change in 2020. We don't know. There are also just through history, different issues become more important through to the population, and there are population changes that influence the, if you want to call it, the progressive versus conservative trends in the country. I myself am seeing that later in the century, we are likely to have a more progressive uh, population mix because we know that the population is changing. A lot of the conservative Part of America is dominated by white, what we could traditionally consider the, the you know, uh, white European uh, background. Whereas we think that by the middle of the century, that that white European background will be minority within the United States. And if you have a large population of, you know, black, Latino, Asian people that see the progressive movement as being, and probably Democrats would probably be still aligned with that, I don't know, uh, more in tune with their values, and then you have still a significant number of a quote, white European population that joins them. I think that that will change the makeup of Congress through this century, and that can change whether a move to amend amendments or other things can get passed. But it's a slow progress, pro slow process. I was going to say, we didn't say do away with corporations. We said they shouldn't have so much power and that money is not really equal to speech and that because somebody has $800 million to give in money to politicians, they shouldn't have much more than we have. To, they, they should allow Congress to make rules on how much things should be be able to give to politicians. And they cut down the rules of some of the laws that Congress passed that said there's a limit to what you can give. All right, so, so <clears throat> Ellen, I just heard you say that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask this question, I actually have two different questions. One is, it sounds like you're an anti-white male that wants to use race baiting push your agenda. Is that true or not? What? No. I'm just trying That's to what say I heard this. You say, That's what I heard you say, though. I didn't hear any race. Oh, yeah, he's, ra he's racist, right? He, he doesn't That's like racist. white males. That's what he said. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I, said, I didn't say that. Heard it, little but then they go away. when they go away, not, life will be better in America. That's what he said. That's I'm right. saying that we are seeing demographic changes in the country based on voting patterns. I would think that those <laughs> democratic, demographic changes are likely 
to result in a more progressive uh, legislatures by the middle of this century. Anti-white. The white's going I'm a white male a myself. Country. I'm not anti-white male. I'm just saying. I'm just reading what what uh, patterns to tell. I heard you say something else. You know. Okay. So the, the last question is the uh, CSR. Are you guys familiar with a CSR is? What that acronym mm -hmm. stands for? No. <clears throat> I was at a party the other day, and seriously, I couldn't believe I heard this. But uh, I heard two corporate two corporate individuals talk to each other. And they mentioned one said, "What's your CS? What's a couple of your CSRs?" So, huh? so, so I'm listening to these people talk, and they, they define what CSR was, and it was corporate social responsibility programs. Okay. And this is a buzzword. Two, you know, two young folks talking back and forth. What's your CSRs? And I think somebody else alluded to corporations are you know helping people out there with, with a lot of different things. They help a lot of poor communities. They help certain uh, uh, fundraisers. They help a lot of situations out there. And that's what I think someone else was saying. Yeah, Mariel's yeah. priority part. It was interesting. Interesting that they would use that buzzword. And, you know, it's incorporates, it's ingrained in their lifestyle. The gentleman in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Did he have his hand up first? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'd like to say there's a big difference between corporations contributing charity to communities and justice. Uh, it's very, very in the vogue and trendy right now for corporations to give a very, very small grain of sand of what their annual earnings are to charity. And uh, rightfully so, they should be commended for that grain of sand compared to people who give zero. But compared to what justice is and what is expected, for the most vulnerable communities of not only the United States, but all communities of the world, uh, corporations have failed in meeting the basic necessities that one would think we, the people of the earth, have provided them with such a wonderful uh, profit margin that they can at least see that our livelihood continues on a minimal basis. So I would say charity and justice are two very distinctly different things. Oh, okay. Generally, at this point, our, our remarks should be followed by a question mark. All right. I, uh, I think you did a great yeah. answer. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> answer, <laughs> not a question. <laughs> right. Rita. Um, does uh, Move to Amend recommend a certain path toward getting this amendment passed? And if so, which one are they recommending? I think they recommend the one where we get Congress to put it out to the states as a, an amendment. And then the states, the Senate legislatures pass it. How many states have passed a resolution so far? A resolution, I think it's 17 or 18. But actually, they need legislation which is different. A resolution has no binding anything. Legislation, there's three, I think, and Illinois is one of them. Uh, that's, uh, Joe wanted to say. Joe, okay, to I'll ask. Something. Charlie won't like it, but I'll ask it's anyway. Since you want regulation of, union, of uh, corporations in all forms, and more civic responsibility, I assume unions are included in this, yes. since they are all corporations? Yes. Well, who controls them? Well, you know, the workers. They are really? included in this, number one. They don't even buy corporations. And they have like one-eighth of the money, or maybe it's 8%, but it's a lot less money than the, all the corporations. I mean, when you look at expenses in politics, Unions don't even come close yeah. to the other corporations. But yes, they're included. We think Congress should make rules against unions just like they should be able to make rules for corporations. Hi, Charlie. <laughs> uh oh. Jeff, did you have a question? Oh, I up. David Travis. <clears throat> yeah, uh, considering that. Uh, that uh, just off the top of my head, uh, and I don't uh, make a habit of following this, I suppose I should, but just off the top of my head, uh, when I see that there are people like 
Bill Gates and uh, and that other gentleman, I can't think of his name Jobs. right now. Uh, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, uh, uh, that they uh, have given many billions of dollars with the expectation of, of uh, realistically wiping out certain diseases around the world and so forth. That's right. And, and uh, then I hear people in here say that uh, corporate charity is not, uh, has nothing to do with justice. I, I find that uh, difficult to accept. And also, even if the, if I may finish, and also, even if the amounts they give are grains of sand compared to what they make, which I don't think is the case, they are still giving a great deal more than all kinds of other people. There's nothing like the rest of the corporations. But the rest of the corporations don't give like those two people give. Mm. Many people who have gained wealth establish foundations to do charitable work both during their life and after they've passed away. And that's very commendable. And that's that's good as in the individuals. They're trying to give back to society and the economy and everything have been good to them. And that's all to be applauded. But the broad spectrum of corporations do not, as corporations, give large amounts to uh, charitable causes. They usually give some because it's usually in, it helps with their public image and other things. They may have some values that help in that regard too. Uh, corporations are different as far as their makeup and so forth. But the issue here is whether corporations should have all these rights of, of, uh, of persons and whether, you know, they should be able to use unlimited funds to, to elect our people to uh, you know affect elections. To or my we, knowledge, there should be rights to have some. To my knowledge, funds. corporations do not have the same exact uh, rights as a person. For example, if a corporation commits a crime, it is the officers of the corporation that are subject to prosecution. Pierce the wall, you pierce the wall, yes, true. So true. the corporation is the not trial. exactly the same. And in as much as I have not been able to look at any statistics uh, or tables as to just how much uh, corporations have given, I'm not in a position to deal with that right now. But you might, if you were going to say these things, you might have brought a table of what, of how many corporations who gave what not, and how much. We're not, we're not talking about them giving. We're talking about them electing our our senators and our representatives and our governor because they put out far more money by the millions than the rest of the people can. We're talking about elections. We're talking about them electing our officials. Any politician that can be right. bought right. is not uh, worth I having an office. Yeah. 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 I have a question. Um, yeah. I have a question. The so legislation that passed in Illinois, it's my understanding that did it favor the Continental Congress or was it for a certain method or what was it? It favored our U.S. Congress putting out an amendment to the states to gratify. Thank you. Okay, uh, Tim. I'd like to know what you guys think of the advantages of corporations and what they can provide for the country. Jobs. I mean, there are some advantages to being able to shield some uh, investments uh, in order to allow take some risk taking. Uh, there were not did not have corporate structures, and everybody had to simply try to invest as an individual, and all of their personal assets were at risk any time a business went bad. You probably would have less risk taken, you probably have less uh, jobs created. And so there are some advantages to creating corporations to allow for, you know, entities where the individuals 
personal wealth is not totally at risk by a, bi a business venture, which can be risky. We know a lot of small startup businesses fail. So a lot of people would not want to take that risk if, if it meant they're going to lose their house or going to lose their other assets. They want, they're willing to invest and risk a certain amount of money, and that's why a lot of businesses will incorporate. And that's reasonable, at least in my viewpoint. Okay. And to, to give some sh shielding to that so that you, know, you can encourage people to take risks and, you know, uh, in investments in businesses and so forth. But that doesn't mean they should have all the rights that the Supreme Court has given them with at, as if they were people. Okay. Uh, oh, my, yeah. Quick uh, uh, charity question, followed by. Uh, yeah. And then a quick, in a nutshell, question. When I watch PBS and I see something sponsored by Coke, is that the same Coke dude? Yes. K O C H. Yes. When PBS is the show is sponsored yes. by blah 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 yes. blah. All yes. these I'm not, Coke. I'm not seeing it. Well, no. actually, there are two brothers that are into politics, and there's two brothers. One brother who is into the arts. It's the same family, but they're not the same. Family. Oh, we should make All a point right. of that. Okay, that was my charity question. So it's not the stick. It's a good Coke. It's a well, we don't know which one it is in this case. It depends. Yeah, it is. Well, obviously, it could be. nobody knows, it could so be. i got to go, go to Google and figure this out. Okay, my second you have question. A question? Is, Mike does. Well, that was my charity question. My second question is, in a nutshell, can you explain the mechanics here? Okay, Chief Roberts said that Citizens United, pretty much unlimited money can go into politics now. What? Then, yeah. you guys have a company called, or an organization <laughs> called, Move to Amend, along with other groups. And so, what Roberts did was, he made, uh, a, did he make a new an amendment to the Constitution? No. Uh, no. Did he, There's an interpretation uh, amend, of the Constitution. Did he amend the Constitution? No. no, they interpreted what the Constitution says, and they said it's a law until that is either changed by a subsequent Supreme Court decision, or unless it is revised by a constitutional amendment. Is that so it? that's what you guys want to do? I don't care which way it's done, but yeah. we're not likely to get this Supreme Court to do anything good for one. So what you want to do is have something in the Constitution that allows for limitations <laughs> on uh, spending by corporations or other entities, unions, whatever. That, for politics. Right, that there should be a more, uh, you know, uh, more modest ability to okay. Yeah, I tried. How many amendments are in the Constitution now? Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. It's around that number. So you want number twenty-eight, right? Yes. Yes. Unless we can, unless something happens that the Supreme Court changes and they change this rule, what would be nice if they would just let let the Congress change it back the way it was, well, where Congress there were lazy. limits. Can you sue the Supreme oh, Court? Oh, come on. <laughs> sue some bastards. <laughs> Charles Payne, right. followed by a team. Sue the Supreme Court. <laughs> the government, well, you can only sue the government if it allows you to sue them. Well, by, the law. Law, by law, they specify when they can be sued. But my okay. question is, okay. my question, no, it is not. Give me a damn lawyer. I mean, people get it quick. Not. I ain't had no motherfucking question. Well then, oh, speak up. <laughs> <laughs> speak up or forever hold your peace. You can't read peace. Unless they allow you to. Shoot. Pal, you need to take this away or you still it? Pal, I want to, and I'm sure most of the panel have, uh, know what I'm about to uh, ask. But since some of the questions being asked ain't even worth asking, therefore, if you had certain information, you could respond to the question and give it the quality that it deserves, and it's a low quality. Now, who have heard of Robert Desco? Who have heard of uh, uh, Buddy Home film? Okay, lady too young, and, uh, and guy too young, but my man over there too young. But listen, Barney Caulfield, and I believe it, uh, uh, subsequently the, the, what they did, they mipped the cooperation, and the people that was 
or bondholders or whatever in the cooperation was obviously taken when these men taking the cooperation and used it for their personal bank. Buddy Cornfield did the same thing. I mentioned these two people because I remember their name being all in the paper over a year. And Robert Besco went down to Cuba and he, he had his own army there, went over to, uh, had his own thing down there and so forth. So, and this was all in the paper. And so I'm bringing that up to say people that ask the question that want to defend cooperation, don't be ridiculous. People have been going to jail because they use the cooperation for everything that what is supposed to not to be. So the panel, please let these people ask these dumb questions. They're trying to defend. No, I'll take that back. Not it's dumb questions. Question. Not dumb questions. It's, it's questions without any basic for a response, as far as I'm concerned. If you want to defend your mama, and if you want to defend something, you will think of some silly shit to do it. The facts don't lie. They right, right. The corporations that did all kinds of shit. Now, I just found anybody in here that don't go tell me that they don't remember this, they don't remember that. Because they're taking these people and put them in the jail. And that's just a little uh, uh, two or three. But right. this happened all the time and people sit around and What's the question, Jane? All right, Jane. Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my question. Why do y'all respond? to the question because that have no, have no validity, have no philosophical basis, and logic is way over there, and we can tell from the uh, conversation that all they doing is defending something, but when you defend something, why don't you come with some, come with some weight? Why don't you come with some fact? Why don't you come with some reality? Anybody can say, not my daddy, not my wife. What's your question, Jane? Then you're a rule breaker. Corporations are formed by people. Some people are good. Some people are bad. Some people will try to steal from corporations. Uh, others are trying to run honest businesses. They're trying to usually make a living, make some money, but maybe give a good service. So there, there's, you've got good people and bad people. You've got this cross spectrum, and. You know, we're not saying all corporations are bad, but we do think that there are limitations that our government should be able to place on corporations in incorporating them, and we don't think that taking off, you know, this spending cap is is something that is appropriate. No, they don't. All right, Charles. Oh, come on, bro. Yeah, the it seems historically Jamestown settlement was actually. The Virginia Company, if I recollect, okay. and so were the other 13 colonies. No. And the course, particularly New York in particular. Um, and these corporations seem to be ingrained in our structure um, inherently. Are you trying to sever them out? That question was already asked in that while you're dealing with corporations under British law, the issue of corporations, we are not opposed to corporations. They're, as I said before, in response to another question, having a structure that allows for investment but allows, limits the, you know, shields and sense of private assets so that people can risk certain amounts and not risk their, all their as assets and try to go into a business venture is, is appropriate to try to encourage business ventures. Let me ask my question real question. Do you, do you think it might be advisable to try the approach of the progressives around the turn of the century to control corporations? I think they tried a variety of things, didn't they? What was those specific project, Charlie? Trust busting. There we go. Reg financial regulation. Well, that's what we're asking for is financial regulations. Yeah. The Supreme Court cut them down. Yeah, there were there, there were many 
uh, abuses of corporations in the Gilded Age, and some of the progressive efforts were to try to limit those. And I think most of us on this panel would agree with those. But there are, should be some limitations on corporations for the public interest. Like strengthening unions was one of them, wasn't it? So, I think there was another. All right, Jim. Yeah, I recently read an interesting article by a, a lawyer who's a liberal activist. I think his name is Kent Greenfield, and the article, I believe, was called something like Let Us Praise Corporations. It was more extended than that, something like Let Us Praise Corporations. And he makes the case that in order to hold corporations accountable, we actually have to extend the paradigm of personhood rather than withdraw it. Because we don't want to be, like in the case of the BP disaster, we don't want to be limited to having to sue only the principals. We want to be able to go after the corporate assets. And well, he, he gives another, a number of other examples. You can go after the corporate assets. The question, the corporation is so that individuals' assets beyond the corporate assets are not at risk, but any of the corporate assets are at risk if you are take a, a corporation into a lawsuit. Uh, the young man in the back, I'm sorry, I haven't met you yet. Oh, hold on, they're not done yet. They're not he's done. So done with, he's still done with it. He's still has to finish his part. Come on, man. Jim, finish it. Have you finished, Jim? Well, just that, that I mean, how would you sue them if they're, if they don't have, what would their standing be in court if they don't have? It, right now, I mean, what we're arguing is that the corporations, uh, are valid, but a corporation would be allowed, has been allowed to be sued for any assets that the corporation owns. If the corporation does something that's illegal, or, or you know, that that's one thing. The, the reason why corporations are founded is that so that assets beyond what's invested in the corporation are not at risk, but just the the, 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 the assets that you know are given to the corporation or or earned by the corporation and get, are, are retained by the corporation. Uh, those are things that are at risk, basically the you know the assets of the corporation. And so that was the case when corporations were first given charters and that's the that's still the case now that the corporations can't be sued for their you know uh, against what assets they hold. But but the individuals who are investors, whether it be you know large investors like their officers, or if it's just any Joe who's bought some shares, they're, they're not, their individual, all they have they at risk come, is what they invest. Yeah, you know, they can't come and take your house. If you own a share of some, because, some yeah, corporation, they can't come and take your house. Which which you you want Can you get a little louder, please? Repeat your question louder. He said, Do you he distinguish said, between he which properties of, yes, of the person you want them to retain and which ones you want to be withdrawn? I don't think they need um, protection from search. Yes, I don't think they need protection from due process of law because I think the corporation should speak if they've done something wrong. Okay. Um, I don't think they should have freedom of speech. I think they should. I think they should allow Congress to decide how much they can spend. I don't think money equals speech. All of the above. Could I add a, a part in here? Uh, corporations have normally a big corporation has the very, very very best lawyer. If somebody, an uh, individual, is trying to sue a corporation, lots of luck. That's your only chance. And we have to realize that Sir? corporations have the people who are like officers, directors, and so forth. They're they're also individuals. And if there's limitations on how much individuals can give to. Uh, Candidates. I mean, these individuals can give that candidate that too. It's just we were looking at it for a even playing field and said there should be reasonable limits, so that there's not domination by, you know, very wealthy people, and there should be a more uh, reasonable playing field. But it's not to say that they can't, you know, of their own as individuals give to candidates. Uh, just you know, uh, all people who are you know citizens of the country should be able to do that. Okay. Just Congress no. should be able to. Uh, 
legislate how much it is. Yes. All right. Now, would the uh, gentleman in the back identify himself and ask his question? Jonathan. Uh, one of the debates I heard that was uh, very helpful in understanding exactly all the issues involved in this was between, uh, I believe his name was David Cobb and another gentleman named James Bopp. Are you familiar with that debate? It's often on Free Speech TV. No, I, I know, I've heard David Cobb quite a few times, but I don't know the other guy. Well, <laughs> if anybody wants to, you know, go to that online, that's very helpful. Uh, that debate, I think about a lot. When I think about is money free speech or is it just monetary paper that we use for our day to day needs to pay for things? And I think it's very logical to just have an experiment to see if money is free speech. Go to the store without any money and try to speak whatever the amount is that they ask you at the cash register to pay for your groceries tomorrow. You know, go to an auto dealership and try to speak the amount that it costs to buy a new automobile. You know, your son or daughter needs a, 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 a new car to get to college every day or uh, for the family needs. Uh, an entity that has human personhood, has a heartbeat and a brain and a voice and a nervous system and a skeleton, uh, it doesn't have to be so complicated. I think that debate between uh, David Cobb and James Bob was very helpful in me understanding. Uh, you can boil it down to some basics if you really want to, how in such a corporate atmosphere like the United States, of course we would be confused on uh, this very basic issue. What's got personhood and what doesn't? Well, we the people have personhood. Corporations obviously do not. Okay. All right. Yeah, I want to finish, if I may. Uh, you know, there's two kinds of way to fight uh, the one percent. One is, uh, is it a bourgeois question? liberal way, which I assume you folks uh, have not been all my life. But there is a different way too, the Bolshevik way. You know, they don't wait. The Bolsheviks didn't go to the Tsar and say, "Hey Tsar, you know, there's people hungry, ignorant, dying of diseases and everything. Try to be more humanitarian, more philanthropic." Russia would have been better off under the Tsar. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> but they participated uh, uh, in such demonstrations. Second question. <laughs> when, when Stalin, that was London, when Stalin came into power, five million uh, kulaks, I think they call them, the wealthy landowners of Ukraine, say, hey, we're going we're gonna to overthrow the revolution in the infancy. We're going to kill all the cows, all the sheep, all the chickens. We're going to burn all the wheat and everything. Yeah. And they're going to come down. But you know, Stalin said, hey, those SOBs, they chose to starve. So <laughs> Stalin let five million Ukrainians starve. Now, would you be willing to go to those methods, or are you going to follow the bourgeois liberal way of going to church and praying, say, God, make your corporations more humanitarian? I'd rather rule so you rule of law any day over the revolutionary methods you're ascribing to, because they're not violent. Okay, you can run for uh, president. I, I, I want to just, <laughs> I just want to say we had a, an inequality conference this last weekend, and Chuck Collins, who's a, a grandson or a great grandson of Oscar Mayer, who, who gave away his money when he got out of college, his, his whatever, it wasn't inheritance. What he said was there are two ways to get rid of inequality. One of them is revolution, the other one is taxation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Tax them. Well, right. Let's go to rebuttals, Brom. Eight o'clock. I do believe that it is time for our rebuttal period. Uh, how many people have uh, remarks to make to the rest of us? Preferably somehow related to the subject. <laughs> None, not necessarily. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. Uh, Go about four minutes, Brown. About, all right, four minutes through speaker, and then our, our speaker.
Okay. First of all, I do remember Robert Vesco and Bernard Cornfield and what criminals they were. And there were many others. Corporations, the power of a corporation has nothing to do with that. There will always be criminals and they'll always do those things. And it has to be the individual that gets prosecuted. Uh, and limiting corporations all that's going to do is change the political structure in, in favor of the far left. And uh, the fact is that uh, it, it, uh, it seems to me that the people who spoke here tonight, that uh, they actually have a different agenda than what they are saying they have. And I want to make it clear that the people of the United States of America have too much knowledge of the great the struggle, the great struggle that was made for our independence during the Revolutionary War. And they have too much of an understanding of, uh, of the political structure and of liberty to let it be stolen away or to let it slip away. So the socialists and the communists are never going to prevail in doing this. Even as we speak right now, there are changes happening that the, the pendulum is swinging more to the right all the time. Thank you. All right, well, there it is. Right on. Right on. Yeah, Charlie, your resident heretic is back today. Get out of my chair. So, I heard this about the Koch brothers. The Koch brothers, 800 and some million dollars. Well, if nothing else, at least they're putting their money where their mouth is. <laughs> Funny thing, on the other side of the coin, there's a lot of other rich people who are liberal. Mm -hmm. uh, Gates, for one, Allen, uh, Jobs, when he was around. They don't seem to contribute to the same cause, to those political causes on the other on their side. They complain about the right wing groups doing it. But they're not doing it for their own people. Anybody remember Air America? Yes. That was going to counter right wing 
Top radio. It was going to be great. Oh, oh was that what you... What do you think? Even the liberals didn't listen to it. They couldn't pay its bills. And who they blame? The right-wing talk people. If you don't even listen to it, and you don't and you don't use the sponsor's products, and you're not willing to pay for it, and then you bitch that the other side's doing it, yeah, free market. Now, I worry about constitutional amendments, especially big ones like this. Oh, we're only going to take a little piece of the corporation's power. Well, the problem with constitutional amendments like this. I don't, and this paperwork is open-ended, calling for a constitutional convention. You don't know what you're going to get out of it. But I guarantee you're not going to like most of it. Everybody has their own pet thing, pet agenda. They're going to want stuck in it. Be warned. Uh, gay rights is a popular thing now. Funny thing about all those states that now have gay rights. Most of them were enforced by a federal court. Not by the states, not by the people or their legislature, but by federal courts. Well, what happens if the states decide to get together and say, no, we're not going to stand for that, we want states' rights, and we don't want the federal government to tell us to do anything? <coughs> you could get that. You definitely wouldn't want 50 different states out here running around loose again. They tried that originally in this country called the Confederation, and it didn't work. Well, it's not working don't, rein no. don't reinvent the wheel. States' rights, all right. Come on. Next. <laughs> Next. All right, Gene. All right, Gene. Yeah, I, I, I ain't got a rebuttal. I got a question. Ask it, you know, I'm just joking. This is my neighborhood, and good question is Gene Archer, and I can assume his association. Rank, uh, rank those other people as high as he is, which is way up. Now, I could have stayed in Acapulco, Mexico, but I rushed up here to listen to my friend Gene Osher. Now, I, I knew the snow was out there, but he's no important than me staying in the sun and so forth and so on. I suppose get a little chuckle from that. But anyway, listen. There's nothing worse than not keeping your words straight, the syllables straight, the uh, building of what the logicians say you're supposed to do, have a, 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 a minor premise and a major premise and a, and a military operative distributed. You got to remember that, people. You can't jump up and, and defend something by talking in some kind of circle of uh, making none what I would call nonsensical statement. Listen, the, 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 the panel was here, according to their literature and their speech, was to say what they need to do to overcome the cooperation. Now, if you listen to these people, and if you've been listening, period, we know the issues that is involved the cooperation in a Supreme Court decision when they said, and, and the speaker made it known, that the clerk uh, wrote down that the cooperation was, a, was a, a, a person, and the Supreme Court didn't say that. The clerk said something like that, and from then on, that's what happened. Now, here comes somebody up to defending the cooperation. Everybody that been around for two days know what cooperation been doing as was getting the uh, time. Now, how much evidence does a, a person need in order to come up with some kind of uh, factual, uh, 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 cognition type of uh, understanding here when you are talking and when you are listening and when you are seeing? Mm. Now, it ain't no secret what the cooperation have done over a period of time. Me too. Now, not only do they take advantage, and I name a couple examples, of the stockholders and, 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 and other entities, not to mention the general public, because they can control the general public. Why? Because they control the government. <laughs> and they use the cooperation to earn this control over the government. Now, 
how you going to sit here and you're over 10 years old and say that, oh, no, 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 the cooperation is good for us. Give me a break. The, co co the word cooperation is worthy in a name. Processing things that should be done, things not should be done, is put in some kind of code, uh, uh, laws, and so forth and so on. Now, if they are not there, then sensible people, intelligent people, can set up and say, hey, we should do this and do that in order to get a proper balance over here, a proper balance over there. Now, if you, if you, want, if you don't want to listen to that, you should ask yourself, why? Why I don't want to listen to somebody that's trying to make something better? Now, if they are being completely <laughs> way over here, then I might back up a little bit, and I might make them something to wake them up, to, to, to bring them back where they're supposed to be. But to sit around and hear so many people talking about, well, we need the cooperation, we, we don't need the goddamn cooperation doing what they're doing. And that is taking over our government, that's uh, 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 running our uh, uh, country, uh, 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 wiping out the middle class, moving the jobs all over the world and so forth, but we need them. Give me a break, please. It's like saying, not my wife, not my son. This is the corporation. This is the We all ask ourselves this question. Uh, who are we? And more importantly, who are we at our best? Um, it's difficult to ask these questions. Are we at our best when we're peaceful? Are we at our best when we're most equal? Are we at our best when we're democratic? Are we at our best when we're most transparent? Are we at our best when we're justice serving as well as justice protecting? Are we at our best when we respect Mother Earth and the quality of our air, land, and water that give us this privilege of living life on Earth. This debate has gone back and forth ever since the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, you know, how is society better served? Through private power and private commons or public cooperation and public commons? I think every day we have to look ourselves in the mirror and also look at each other and humanize this dialogue far better than our failed corporate media has done. There's a reason why we're so confused, myself included, about this issue is because the media is certainly going to distort and distract and try to throw anything against the wall that brings our understanding farther apart from each other in a divide and conquer predictable result. Uh, in this particular part of the world, we call ourselves Americans, or some people call themselves United Statesians, or the people of the USA. Let's just think of ourselves for one second as human beings. We have personhood. That's why we want to live in a country that is more peaceful to each other, more loving and equal, more democratic, more transparent, more just and more respectful of the planet itself, which is the foundation for every other issue we hold near and dear to our hearts. I think the Supreme Court has really opened up a, uh, you know, a box of worms that I'm glad they did, because this could be the start of a mass, peaceful, democratic uprising where people say, you know what, back in the uh, last century when they had those peaceful general strikes and they said no more to corporate rule, democracy is too important and too beautiful to sit on the sidelines and watch it be just swept away by somebody who happens to be a millionaire or a billionaire. Uh, this could be an awakening of the sleeping giant of we, the peaceful, loving, democratic, transparent, justice, and respecting of Mother Earth people of the United States, and it couldn't happen a second too soon. Okay. Friends and uh, fellow Chicagoans, you know, uh, the, I'm going to respond to three of the previous speakers. The last gentleman right now, he said, uh, who are, who are, well, I'll tell you me, 
I can confess for myself. I think I know who I am. Aristides Prokopiou Yanimbas. And my historic name is Harris of Chicago. That's second. Number two. The second, the first gentleman said, the first man who spoke, the resident, profound political philosopher of the right wing. I don't know his name, but he's a fine gentleman because he provokes us to think. Now, he first spoke about the principles and the founding revolutionaries of 1776 and the great foundations of freedom they fought to achieve, which we enjoy today. Well, this is a total lie from the 1776 lie of those uh, morally transvestite founding fathers <laughs> who spoke one thing and practiced something else, swindlers, slave owners, and all kinds of bad things I could say about them. <coughs> they sexually abusing the slave women. Well, these guys, they are nothing to be proud of. You know, I renounce those guys like I renounced Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary after the read the Bible. It took me five years. And I found out my Sunday school teachers were lying to me. Second, 1776. And also he said the majority of the Americans are going right. Well, 1776, like the Gulf of Tonkin and September 11, war causes belly every time. That means they had to find an excuse to kill people. And so, if you heard about or read about, there's a book now by Professor <laughs> Gerald Horn. He's a, looks like a mulatto gentleman from a, a professor at uh, Texas, one of the universities, and he, he wrote a book, The, Re the Counter-Revolution of 1776, which was not to bring slavery, and the, I mean, and the, to liberate the colonies, but it was to be able to perpetuate the slave trade because the motherland, England, was going to abolish the slave trade. So they succeeded in that and kept it going until 1865, but even worse, it's worse now for the, the African Americans than it was then. Because then, in those days, 98%, I believe, according to my estimation, of the slave owners would not let their slave go out in the woods or go out in the street and die. They let them stay in the plantation and live the old age and die in dignity on the plantation. With, three meals a day with a doctor, with shelter, close to their relatives, to their friends. So now, for white slaves, black slaves, yellow slaves, Mexican slaves, it's worse now. They throw you out on the street and they let you die. So now, as far as propaganda, you know, everything's propaganda. There's a book by Jacques Ellul, which I read about five pages, but I remember that Propaganda is the title of the book. Fifty years ago, maybe I bought it. And it says, it has to be total. Now, this is, now, the military, Industry. the war monger industry is based on propaganda and lies. But also the homo promo industry, that's an industry that I will write about someday. I write a book. Homo promo means homosexual promotion. Even from primary school now, I went to a college, uh, conference they had with all kinds of gifts to give <coughs> little children now take the rainbow flag, a flag uh, promoting homosexuality at the uh, elementary school level. So you take it home and say, Mommy, look at this beautiful, it doesn't say homo promo or it's beautiful <laughs> to be gay or anything like that, but this is the flag, the rainbow flag. So in other words, we need a propaganda campaign for peace. There's warmongers and there's peacemongers. The peacemongers, they shave, the Vietnam days, they shave their beards and all that, and these SOBs are now on La South Street, they're making three, four hundred thousand dollars a year, and uh, they forgot all about that stuff. So now we need a new movement because 
I'm finishing with this. We are now in the second decade of World War III, okay. and they don't plan to finish until they exterminate half of the planet. Nice, All right, are these your glasses, Carla, here? Yeah, yeah don't, don't forget them. Um, all right, let me thank our three speakers. Thank you for the time and effort to them and for the handouts, which we're all going to look through, I will, on your efforts to, to uh, rectify this situation. Um, I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. Um, we have three entities in conflict. We have the business CEO corporations, we have the government, and then we have the populace, the population. And the thing is that the situation you must avoid under all circumstances is when the government gets together with the CEO corporate yes. against yes. the yes. third party. Um, this is somewhat happening today. Um, my, this effort is very important. At least half the population is against that corporations are acting in their own self-interest, or in their, their interest. Sure. You heard some people here tonight <laughs> who actually are making apologies for corporations, saying that they're philanthropic and therefore good, huh. better than social services administered nationwide. Uh, we should rely upon uh, some philanthropic charity or something, I guess, instead of a program administering social services, which is an absurdity. Um, the other thing that you see is a marked resistance to any form of regulation of the corporations and the CEOs. If you follow Congress at all, you'll see that they despise the regulatory agencies, in particular OSHA, uh, EPA, SEC. Yes, anybody who gets interferes with their opportunity to make money, to profit, and to restrict them in any fashion. They uh, alluded to this earlier. They've convinced people that they are in fact job creators and <clears throat> open up opportunities for all of us through their selfish efforts, which is absurd. Now, um, what you're looking at is called the legislative solution, which I is difficult. From labor law, I can assure you that the, <coughs> the working people have not benefited through the legislative process. It's the least positive. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try. I mean, I lobby for labor laws and do so all the time. I'm going to Washington next month to talk about them and do that. It is certainly important. Is it the avenue that brings us results? No. Please keep in mind that it possibly isn't. It's in particularly now. It doesn't mean it's impossible. It should be surrendered with the victor or whoever controls the field of battle and never give up the field of battle. And by the way, Joe, you're absolutely and totally incorrect that you want a complicated. What the, the way they wrote it is precisely the way the laws are written. They're not going into detail. Now, they're refined later in a regulatory fashion or something in application, but they're never written in detail. This is, this man, you this read is, the this is I work with it every day. I read the law. And I assure you that what they wrote is totally, perfectly, ladies and gentlemen, perfectly appropriate for adoption by a legislative assembly. And don't it does you don't need detail. They don't do put the details in the law. But people who don't know this 
will tell you that you have to do that. Or it's omitting something. Or it's flawed or something. No, no. The laws very often are one sentence. Believe you me. Anyhow, let's see what else I'm going to talk about. Yeah, uh, there were efforts. Uh, it, the situation got very, very dark uh, around the turn of the century, uh, which generated the progressive movement, which had a variety of approaches to it. Among them was the formation of the organized labor movement, uh, such as began in 1905. As a matter of fact, in, at the darkest days of the progressive movement, there was not one union in the city of Chicago. And you could have been apprehended because it opposed the corporate powers. And they didn't like them. And so you were not allowed to do so. And defiantly, other individuals, in fact, did so. Uh, it's an interesting story. It continued on for several decades. All right, you're telling me to get out of here? One other problem we got. Jeff is here someplace where I saw <coughs> one of the arguments here is who controls the microphone. We've been over this at the college. Free speech, I heard something here. Yes, whoever controls the mic microphone, this controls a great deal. And the other problem we got, though, and why we've got to start on this, is that these corporations are going to try to, and he's, he's, he thinks they're so wonderful, they're going to try to, you got into this here, they're going to try to slip inside, overseas, whatever, work offshore, or the islands that you were talking about earlier when we started tonight. These corporations, there's no, what are they doing? 500 corporations in a little Caribbean island, I don't know. <laughs> but this is bigger than Wall Street in New York. So maybe they're up to something that ain't any good. Anyhow, thank you very much. Let's go get to this thing. Your islands. <laughs> By the way, we got short schedules if you want them. I would like to thank our speakers for coming out here tonight. I think it's right. The only thing I would caution against is I don't agree with old Joe over there about very much. But I will say this for one point that he made. I do not encourage anyone to call another constitutional convention. Because if you do, you may not necessarily like what comes out of it. They could just as easily uh, decide to get rid of the Bill of Rights. So, no, I don't look with a favor on a constitutional convention. If you want to amend the Constitution, that's one thing, depending upon what the amendment is about. But, no, I'm not a big fan of calling another constitutional convention that you. Um, the comment was made earlier that some of the colonies, that all the colonies owed their start to commercial corporations. Some of them did, but not all of them. Some of them, like the state of Maryland, or what was in the colony of Maryland, were started when the king of Great Britain at the time made a grant of land to uh, Lord, toward the Calvert family, the Lords of Baltimore. Uh, it was started as a, as a haven for, for Roman Catholics. Now, they weren't allowed to build huge cathedrals or whatnot, but nevertheless, they also weren't persecuted there either. And while I'm not saying it was exactly a haven of liberty, it was after all a slave state until the Civil War. Nevertheless, its origins were not due to a commercial corporation as such. Finally, and I find it appalling that the remarks would come from somebody who wasn't even here during the presentation, but we'll let that pass. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I do not favor a Bolshevik revolution or any other kind of revolution here in this country. I think our problems, great though they are, can be solved without that. And when you throw into it that the Bolsheviks were not necessarily sympathetic to people to the, to the rights of minorities such as Jews, no. I'm totally against it any sort of, of revolution of that kind, whether of the left or of the right. Indeed, one of the great, one of the great things, that, one of the many things that we owe to Franklin Roosevelt was that he kept the country from drifting into a revolutionary direction, either of the left or the right, 
He kept it fixed where it belongs, right firmly on the center. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Andy Anderson. I would like to thank the speakers tonight also for a, a great presentation uh, hitting on several points about where we are and what needs to be done. Um, I don't know if a lot of people are not familiar with uh, the former Supreme Court Justice <laughs> Lewis Powell, but he wrote a memo before he got on the court. He wrote a memo in, around 1971 urging the Chamber of Commerce and corporations to form a coalition to fund media outlets, think tanks, uh, radio stations, television stations, to begin taking back the equity <clears throat> that was being built up by the middle class. He said, a strong middle class is a threat to the billionaires that own and operate our political system. And uh, the middle class in America has been solidly under attack on all fronts since 1973. That was the peak year. We've been in decline ever since. And with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980 and the all-out beginning of the war on unions and working people, we're in our 35th year now of Reaganomics. In 1980, uh, John Goffman, in this book, Adam's Eve, Ending the Nuclear Age, uh, John Goffman, the father of uh, radiation and human health, he published an article called The Law Versus Justice because he was seeing cases where people were jumping fences and protesting nuclear power plants uh, because there was a so-called uh, a higher a higher calling, uh, that is to say you have to protest something before it gets so big that it will be killing your children and your neighbors. Well, his, his article, the concept, the law versus justice, said that we, we need to teach again that everything that happened to the Jewish and the Polish people in the camps in Germany was legal. The politicians passed laws making it legal. They had bureaucrats signing papers every step of the way, moving people along right into the gas chambers. It was all legal. And we hear people talking about today, you don't want to be a law-abiding citizen in America. You don't want to uh, have a revolution. Well, our corporation, you know, the, the Citizens United ruling is one of the most treasonous rulings that's ever come out of the Supreme Court. It's not just a, a political statement. It's treason against yeah. the American people. And uh, our Congress people, um, you know, the corporate, I, I, I talk about corporate media. The corporate media are very, very accurate. They report a lot of good things. But on certain big things, they promote mythology and they run a blackout on the reality. And the New York Times is the leader of promoting certain crimes against humanity by covering up the evidence. The New York Times is very accurate in their article uh, around June of 2001 showing that George W. Bush lost the election. But they didn't report it in real time. They waited six months until after the damage was done. The New York Times was very, very instrumental with their reporter Judith Miller promoting the lies leading up to the invasion of Iraq. And now we all know that Iraq is one of the biggest crimes against humanity <clears throat> with the depleted uranium dust dispersal weapons, <clears throat> Iraq, is un Iraq is uninhabitable for humans now. Any woman living in Iraq can forget about having healthy babies. The, the population is being eliminated with radioactive dust dispersal weapons. Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kosovo all have, it's like living downwind to the cloud of Chernobyl in those three countries because of the tons of radioactive dust dispersal weapons that have been dispersed all over the country. None of this is in the American media. But the first step, you know, we teach seventh graders. In order to solve any problem, you have to first correctly identify the problem. You have to first even admit you have a problem. We have people in this country that are immune to facts. And as the database of facts gets bigger and bigger, showing that their belief is pure mythology, they dig their heels in and become more and more aggressive in promoting that mythology. 
and uh, we're going to see that in September on a fellow that is promoting the myth of what happened on 9-11. The reality is something else altogether. So uh, at, at one point, you know, things get better when we reach critical mass. We have, it's easier for us to breathe here now because we have a smoke-free environment. Thirty years ago, you could get into a fist fight if you asked somebody to put off a cigarette next to you. Remember that? Some of you are laughing like you know what I'm talking about. So knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. And uh, the first step is understanding what's really happening and joining with other people that understand and move forward from there. Thank you. Welcome to Vigata, man. Welcome to Vigata. Personhood. It's very important to recognize humanity, uh, the life, the feelings, the opinions, the dignity, the grace that exists in any person or collection of persons, whether it's a corporation, or a union, or a church, or a group of people, united by a language, or whatever circumstances that do unite them. And it's it's important to know what is important in that humanity and what it is that's essential uh, to being alive and human. And that's what we see in Jesus. And that's why it's so important why there is a religion of, of Jesus being the Son of God or uh, the expression of what it is to be holy and precious. Right. Uh, oh, uh, Susan? Susan? Uh, yes, sir. Don't go without this. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. Uh, uh, we see a little bit of that sometimes in some uh, uh, of our uh, endeavors. And sometimes uh, we see a whole lot of sins uh, of failing to be what we could be and would be and should be. And uh, we should be accountable, whether in, in, as individuals or as corporations or as unincorporated groups of mobs of people. <laughs> but I, I would hope that uh, we, we look to be a little more human. And uh, uh, I do see in Jesus who of blood for others, uh, uh, a real model. Thank you. All right. All right. Okay. That's it. And last remarks. You guys. I want to ask uh, our presiding chairman here about Jesus. Oh, the speakers have last remarks. Not everybody, yeah, yeah, not yeah. everybody yeah. wants yeah. to yeah. ask them on your own. All right, all right, all right. Yeah. No, there's an open mic. What was yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 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 Open mic at the Yeah, it's a historic moment. A historic moment indeed. We've actually ran out of things to say. I would ask you about Jesus. Uh, well, you know, one thing you got to realize is that I'm not for the abolition of corporate personhood. Here's why. 
people have to pay their bills. Corporate personhood is nothing more than a set of laws that are instituted by our government. And if our corporations perhaps were held to the accountability that a person had, such as paying their bills, criminal liabilities, and other sorts of uh, things that people are responsible for, we may find ourselves in a better society. I do agree with one thing, that sometimes certain modifications to the laws have to be made. But as far as the fundamental structure of a corporation is concerned, that's something that we should not toy with. Oh. The reason I say that is because it's probably the best, as I said, the best invention that helped modernize America was the invention of the corporation and the revenue bond and the stock market. And they allow a large aggregation of capital together under a group of investors to get large projects done. Let me give you a couple of examples. One was the building of our railroads from years ago. Number two was the development of our telecommunication system under AT&T. The monopoly. It was a monopoly, but it was also broken up, and it was done under the rules of, ne of, ne of neutrality. And at the same time, what many of you don't realize is that, uh, how many of you have remember a corporation called Global Crossing? Yeah. Thank you. You know what the you know, Global Crossing did? No. They wired the world. They were the ones who laid most of the undersea cables that developed the internet. And yes, they did went, go bankrupt. And they were bought out by another corporation that was able to buy them at dirt cheap prices and able to wire the world. And I think we can all agree that in certain, in certain, well, I guess it went out again. He's plugging it in. Ah, uh, oh. Yeah, we don't want to miss this corporate. Well, the one thing you have to realize, Charlie, is that, you know, without your corporations, there wouldn't be unions. There wouldn't be jobs. There wouldn't be, without the vast accumulation of wealth in the hands of the few to provide jobs for your unions, it would not be a thing. But I'm also saying, too, workers do need rights. They do need, you know, they do need to be protected because there are certain people who do operate large corporations that could benefit from some unions. I'm naming, for one, Walmart in particular. I'm not, a, I'm not an anti-union man, nor am I an anti-corporate man. I'm for the principles of countervailing power done by the court system, by our legislature, and by our government. I'm not against government regulation because it does provide I think, I think it right now we're a little bit too far swinging towards business in the large corporations and there may need to be brought a little bit more under some form of control, particularly in the areas of taxation, the corporate inversions and overseas things. If you're going to do business in a country, you've got to have an office there and you've got to have some form of uh, accountability there. The, the, back, the, the benefits of having a, a corporation are very wide and well run indeed, but there's also certain responsibilities that corporations have, such as record keeping, such as maintaining a board of directors, such as filing of certain public records. And if you ever want to see how a publicly traded corporation does, there's a Securities and Exchange Commission that requires the filing of 10K quarterly reports that you can anybody can take a look at. And there are very strict enforcement mechanisms for this. Private equity corporations, other places, there's tax records that you can also get access to. And why are we, and there are certainly a lot more available now than they ever were thanks to the internet. Now, the one area I think we all ought to really worry about though is not so much free speech on corporations, but the holding of our own personal data that these corporations have. Did you know that there's a corporation right now in uh, based out of Schaumburg, Illinois, I, or maybe it's down south of the world, AXICOM. They hold more data about us than the federal government does or the NSA ever will. And all it takes is the government being a client can purchase this data from us and find out. As a matter of fact, many people in law enforcement see this company as a better repository than the old criminal database system because they hold everything about us from our shopping patterns, to our credit reports, to our very thing that we need to do. And you have to remember that not only should corporations be held to the subject of not being able to make our papers and records public, but we should too as well 
not allow these corporations to do the same thing. Again, though, it's not exactly a new world with the Internet. We've been here before. A lot of these same principles were talked about when the printed media and books first came in, and we developed things like copyrights, like, you know, fair use doctrines and everything else. And a lot of these can be applied to the same thing. For example, we just recently had something uh, that the Senate and House uh, recently regulated called net neutrality. That was basically brought about in the 1930s from the large Ma Bell charging more to corporations than they were to individuals who were more frequent users of business phones. And the fact of the matter was, was that at that point in time, they, had to, they were required then to carry every phone call and they were required to bring service to every place in the United States in a, in as a response to their monopolistic power at the time. Well, they were broken up in the 80s. Kind of funny, it's now resurrected itself as the same type of corporation <laughs> with about the same amount of power, but yeah, yeah. look how many lawyers and trial lawyers they employed over the last <laughs> few years. The thing, the, the point of the matter is this, the world is getting smaller, we're getting a lot more complicated in the way we do things, but it's also, in a sense, provided a lot more benefits as well. Without Bill Gates and his corporation, who are saying in the most recent report that abject poverty could be wiped out in the next 15 years through the spread of globalization and capitalism, what? that to me is a real good thing. <laughs> Read about it, Charlie. It's going to happen I fairly a soon. On child labor. And Charlie, you labor. know, it'll, it'll stop as far, once you get the power of capitalism unleashed. poverty? In the elimination of poverty. Mm -hmm. poverty. You're much better, Charlie, now than you were 100 years ago. And 300 years ago, everybody was in abject poverty. Praise be to globalizations, the modern corporation, the modern forms of government, the internet, the, huh? the small business owner who takes the risks and represents things. Oh, yes, I applaud them all. And especially to a lot of you rich people who take risks with your funds oh. to provide jobs. Oh, Thank you very much. Okay, our speakers get the last word. Yes. Our speakers get the last word. Don't be nice to us. Carla is still here. Speakers get the last words. <laughs> I'll just say a couple things. Um, one of the uh, rebuttals talked about the constitutional conventions. I spoke about the various means of amending the Constitution. That was just to lay out the spectrum of what was possible. It was not saying that uh, Move to Men was recommending a constitutional convention. I was just explaining the various options. So uh, the speaker who thought that Move to Men was recommending a constitutional convention I had a misunderstanding if that was what his understanding was. Okay. So, and we are not anti-corporation. We just feel that there should be appropriate limitations and particularly that uh, free speech does not give corporations or other non-humans a right to unlimited uh, spending of money for political influence. Okay. I just wanted to reiterate that we're not against corporations. We think there should be corporations, and yes, they do provide jobs, although small businesses provide more jobs than all the corporations in the U.S. So Most of them are corporations. Yeah. All right. All right. Yay. Very good. Very good. All right, what about Jim? you? Well, uh, thank all of you for uh, your comments. Uh, I love my people, Unitarian Universalists. They're great people. I just love them. But sometimes we don't have perhaps as vigorous a debate as we ought to have. And certainly this place, College of Conflict, <laughs> maybe we can add that to it. So, uh, and it helps us because when we go to other groups, and, uh, hey, we, we like a tough audience. Thank you. All right. All right. All right.
And Brahm? Ah. Oh, We're deterred. Very good. You unis here uh, <laughs> causing trouble. Oh, yeah. It's causing trouble. Thank you all for coming. And drive safely. I, I see very wet streets out there. The temperatures are falling. Beware of ice.